We are indeed privileged to have with us this evening Mr. A.J. Mustay to share with us his thoughts about the events of the 1930s in which he was an active participant. For half a century, Mr. Musty has been a radical activist in the cause of peace and social justice. And it was he who pioneered in the use of nonviolent resistance as a technique of social action. Mr. Musty was born in the Netherlands and came in steerage to America at age six. He was raised in a Dutch community in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and attended Hope College, from which he received a BA and AM. He then went on to the Theological Seminary of the Reformed Church and received the degree of Bachelor of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary. He was ordained in the ministry of the Reformed Church of America. And during World War I, was minister of a church in Newtonville, Massachusetts. Because of his religious convictions, he was a pacifist and resigned uh, his church under pressure. Because of his commitment to social justice, he became a leader in the textile strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts of 1919. And this led to his work with the Amalgamated Textile Workers during the early 20s as General Secretary. During the 20s, he was director of Brookwood Labor College, a, an educational institution dedicated to training militant progressive labor leaders. In the early 30s, he was chair, excuse me, chairman of the Conference for Progressive Labor Action, which sought to organize the basic mass production industries. And during the decade of the 30s, he was active in various strikes and organizing campaigns, such as the Toledo Autolite strike, the General Motors strike, the Goodyear tire and rubber strike. In 1940, he assumed the post of Executive Secretary of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a post which he held until 1953 when he became Secretary Emeritus. In recent years, Mr. Musty has devoted his major attention to the development of a radical, politically relevant, nonviolent movement. He has served as chairman of the Committee for Nonviolent Action and as a member of the Executive Committee of the War Resisters League. In this activity, he has participated actively in the voyage of the Golden Rule, Omaha Action, uh, the San Francisco to Moscow Walk for Peace, among other uh, activities. He is one of the editors of Liberation Magazine and is the author of Nonviolence in an Aggressive World, published in 1938, and Not by Might, published in 1947. He is also the subject of a biography by Nat Hentoff entitled Peace Agitator. It gives me great pleasure to, produce, to introduce to you at this time Mr. Musty. Uh, the uh, subject of this uh, talk is my experience in the political and radical struggles of the 30s, and it will be uh, primarily autobiographical, as I have been asked to make it. On Friday, February 4, 1966, 
newspapers throughout the country carried the news that a presidential blue ribbon national commission on technology, automation, and economic progress had issued a report stating that the federal government should guarantee every American family a minimum annual income of perhaps $3,000 per year. Other recommendations in the report were that the federal government should provide for free education through the junior college level, that blue-collar workers should be paid annual salaries instead of hourly rates, and that half a million jobs should be created at a first-year cost of $2 billion for the hardcore jobless in hospitals, schools, police departments and, quote, other useful community enterprises, end of quote. The commission was indeed a blue ribbon one, though it would hardly have been so regarded in the United States of three decades ago, which is the subject of this paper. The two leading members of the commission were Thomas J. Watson, Jr., board chairman of the IBM, and Walter Ruther, President of the United Automobile Workers Union. It included four executives of a corporate industry, in addition to Mr. Watson, two labor union executives, in addition to Mr. Ruther. The other members were labor arbitrators and college professors, all members of what might be called the liberal establishment. The headlines announcing this event struck me as I was in the midst of trying to recreate for myself the social and political events and atmosphere of the 30s. And this announcement left me gasping at the contrast between then and now. Then was a time when the nation had just begun to emerge from a depression that appeared to have shaken the very foundations of the economy. My three sisters <clears throat> and their families were typical of thousands upon thousands who had lost, or all but lost, the homes they had acquired by 20 years of toil and arduous living. The unemployed were still organizing and picketing to get enough relief to fend off hunger and to make it possible for children to attend public schools in something a little above the rags. The workers in the mass industries were engaged, as the decade of the 30s wore on, in an epical and bloody struggle for the right to organize. If any group had come forward in those days with proposals remotely resembling those of the watson Ruther Commission, its members would have been denounced as utopian dreamers and Bolsheviks, but not in polite or even printable language. Even now, let me note in passing, Arthur Kroc, in the New York Times of February 6, still 1966, comments that if the recommendations of the Presidential Commission were to become, quote, the state of the Union, without wrecking it, the American form of government would have been supplanted by a socialist system in which public power is totally federalized." End of quote. Mr. Kroc closes his column, however, with a remarkable tribute to a man who was battling in the 30s for a program considerably more moderate, and a man who has appeared in this series at this university. After expressing the opinion that Congress may be coming to the point of disapproving the more radical of the great society legislative proposals, Mr. Kroc concludes, and again I quote, but if any of them become law, it is to be hoped Norman Thomas will still be around to administer them. He is the only citizen in sight 
who is both learned in the philosophy of socialism and knows the responsible limits to enforcing it in the American society. End of quote. It is superfluous to remark that such an observation by a conservative columnist on the New York Times is another revealing instance of the psychological distance between now and then. Let me turn now to my experience in the labor and radical movements of the 30s. The first section will center around Brookwood Labor College, a resident institution in suburban northern Westchester County on an estate near Katona, New York, which may be a familiar place to some of you who probably come from New York. It was founded in September 1921 and ceased to exist in 1937. My own connection with it was terminated in September, in the spring rather, of 1933. My direct contact with the labor struggle had begun early in 1919 in a strike of 30,000 textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Shortly after the armistice, which terminated World War I, with two other young Protestant ministers who had lost their pulpits during the war because of their pacifism, I had gone to Lawrence when it became evident that another mass strike would break out in that city, which had been the scene of a dramatic strike under IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, leadership in 1912. Perhaps this is the point at which I should state the inner attitude and conviction which took a young pacifist clergyman, quite inexperienced in such matters, into a turbulent strike situation, led him to accept, after a few days, what amounted to leadership of that strike and to a lifelong involvement in one way or another in social and political struggles. So far as my own reading goes, it is best expressed, this motivation and inner attitude of mine, in the writings of Martin Buber, what he calls the religious normative principle manifests itself as an essentially historical one. There is an indissoluble relation between the superhistorical and history. Quote, the superhistorical molds the historical, but does not replace it. At another point in his book, At the Turning, Buber refers to those who find in God an escape from nature and history, but contends that this is the very opposite of the relations of the God of Israel toward creation and history. And here I quote, he has placed man in the center of reality in order that he should face up to it. And this leads to a perpetual and often anguish and seemingly futile effort which Buber sets forth in this sentence. True, it is a difficult, a tremendously difficult undertaking to drive the plowshare of the normative principle into the hard sod of political fact. But the right to lift a historical moment into the light of superhistory can be bought no cheaper. During the four-month strike in Lawrence, a national organization of textile workers was formed substantially aided by Sidney Hillman's Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. It was named Amalgamated Textile Workers of America. And parenthetically, Hillman, it may be relevant to remark, was the Sidney of Franklin D. Roosevelt's Clear It with Sidney instruction to New Deal politicos in the 30s. I became national secretary 
of the amalgamated textile workers. The early 20s were not favorable to the establishment of unions in the textile industry. The administration of a labor union was hardly a natural occupation for me. One episode of that period perhaps merits attention. It was during my term as national secretary of the Textile Workers Union that Moscow set up the Red International of Labor Unions as a rival to the non-communist Trade Union International. The Amalgamated Textile Workers was one of the unions invited to become a charter member of the new international. Many of the young textile workers on our executive board were impressed by the invitation and also favorably disposed to the Russian Revolution in that early heroic period. My argument that a union which had as yet few stable local affiliates in the United States had no business presenting itself as a national body which could honestly take part in establishing a world organization won out, however, and the ATW of A did not send a delegate to that Moscow gathering. Whenever uh, this uh, question of, of the relationship between a national body which makes some pretensions and uh, a body which has the right to make pretensions comes up, I am reminded that in the early days of the labor movement in Great Britain, there was what was called the Grand National Consolidated Union of Great Britain, Ireland, and the world. It had not a single functioning local union in Great Britain or Ireland or the world. In the summer of 1921, a number of leading progressive trade unionists, such as James Maurer, head of the Pennsylvania Federation of Labor, John Fitzpatrick, the fighting head of the Chicago Federation of Labor, and Fania Cohn of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, together with some leading educators, among whom John Dewey was one, were interested in developing a labor movement in education movement in this country along the lines of the movement in Great Britain. One of their objectives was the establishment of a resident college for active workers in unions. The estate in Westchester County, already referred to, was made available to them, and in September 1921, Brookwood Labor College opened its doors to its first class. At the urging of the founding group, I had resigned my position with the Textile Workers Union and became the educational director of the school. The college, which did not bestow degrees or give marks or certificates of any kind, did not make any pretense of being neutral. It was identified with the labor movement and in a broad sense with the struggles of the workers. Its labor directors and faculty members had a progressive and radical orientation. No political lines were drawn in admitting students, as that, uh, so that typically the student body included conservative trade unionists as well as communist party members and several shades in between. On the other hand, the school was not under the control of any party. It was influenced by Marxist thought, but was not Marxist. The faculty members were chosen for their competence as scholars and teachers and were free in their classrooms and in their life outside the classroom and school. The unifying central concern was to contribute to the development of a trade union, political and cultural movement adapted to the American scene and contributing to the achievement of a democratic society in the full sense of such a term. Brookwood had the support of a number of the more progressive labor unions and the respect of many figures of the academic and intellectual community of the 20s. By the same token, it was from the outset suspect to the hierarchy 
of the American Federation of Labor in the Coolidge-Hoover era. In August 1928, at the annual convention of the AFL in New Orleans, all affiliates of the AFL were urged to withdraw support from the college and to warn their members from coming under its dangerous radical influence. The condemnation was based on a secret report by Vice President Matthew Wall to the Executive Council of the Federation. The trade union members of the Brookwood College Board pleaded in vain with their trade union <coughs> brethren to grant them the democratic right to see the report on the basis of which they and the institution were condemned. It was denied. It was rumored in reliable circles that an important item in the list of charges was that May Day was observed at Brookwood and that at a recent May Day celebration, the portrait of Samuel Gompers, deceased and revered leader of the Air Favelle, was hung side by side with that of Eugene Debs and Nikolai Lenin. <laughs> the offense, it was implied, would not have been so serious if only Gompers' portrait had been left out. Another feature of the 1928 AFL Favelle Convention, pronouncement on educational matters, was the condemnation of John Dewey as a pernicious and subversive influence in American society. Brookwood weathered that crisis. None of the trade union members of the board of directors resigned. Students kept on coming. Graduates, many of whom had proven their devotion and competence in the unions to which they had returned, remained loyal. Despite the depression, the school managed to remain financially solvent. The essential integrity of the course it had pursued is perhaps attested by the fact that about the same time that the AFL made its pronouncement, the Young Workers League Communists warned its members to stay away from Brooklyn. It proclaimed, quote, Brookwood is no more communist than the executive board of the AFL itself. The YWL will continue its struggle against Brookwood and its ideology and will make every effort to destroy whatever influence it may have among working youth." End of the quote. The Daily Worker commented that Brookwood's fate at the hands of the Executive Council is one more demonstration that those who stand neither with the right nor the left get the bricks from both extremes. Brookwood encountered a truly serious crisis in 1933, and it may be said that it arose largely out of the effort to stand neither with the right nor with the left, to which certain participants in the social and political struggles, including myself, were committed. The Communist Party, having weathered its struggles with the Trotskyist left and the Lovestoneite right and expelled them both, settled down in the early 30s to its involvement in the big organizing campaigns which followed on the New Deal legislation which established the right to organize and bargain collectively. Largely because of the efforts of its members and leaders, of the efforts which they threw into the strikes and the organizing campaigns of the early and middle 30s, the Communist Party gained a foothold in many unions and control in many, uh, in a considerable number. Many working class elements and also many intellectuals were drawn into the party and its front organization. The Socialist Party, which had exercised a great influence in the garment trades unions and in the mining sections, for example, of the country, lost much of its appeal in that period when a good many of its immediate demands were incorporated into Roosevelt's New Deal legislation. 
It was afflicted by internal conflicts, to some of which I shall refer in a moment. Most important, the leaders of the garment trades unions, who had experienced bitter struggle with the communists for union control in the 20s, now found relief for their members from unemployment and poverty in the gradual emergence of the economy from the depths of the Depression. Concurrently, they were drawn into the Roosevelt orbit and the Rooseveltian Democratic Coalition. They carried their members with them and were thus also delivered once and for all from internecine battles with communists. At the same time, the Socialist Party lost its foothold in these unions and its source of moral and financial support in them. In these circumstances, people who in a number of cases had been connected with Brookwood in one way or another, who had been radicalized by the Depression but could not go along with the Communist Party nor follow confidently in Roosevelt's trade, felt the need for an instrumentality that would enable them to operate in the mass struggles of the new period. That instrument was in its initial form a conference for progressive labor action. It actually came into being in the 20s and originally included trade unionists and a number of Socialist Party members and leaders. CPLA sought to combat gangsterism and corruption in the labor unions. It condemned the AFL, largely composed of craft unions, for its failure to tackle seriously the job of organizing the workers in the basic industries into industrial unions. It urged political action, preferably in the form of a Labour Party, fashioned on the lines of the British Labour Party. The CPLA provided leadership and financial support to strikes, especially in the textile and mining industries, where conditions were distressing and AFL leadership indifferent. In a number of states or sections of states, it organized the unemployed into militant unemployed leagues, which served several purposes, such as providing an outlet for local workers' leadership, giving a sense of dignity to the unemployed who were no longer passively submitting to their lot, actually ameliorating their condition somewhat, and contributing to the channeling of dissent, which, among other things, led to the election of Roosevelt in 1932. The CP had its own organization of unemployed, known as the Unemployed Councils. They were more numerous than the leagues because the CP had larger forces at its command than the CPLA. But in no place where the leagues were set up were the councils able to get a foothold. Let me now comment on the crisis which overtook Brookwood in 1933, to which I referred a moment ago. In the beginning, the CPLA had been largely an arm of Brookwood. Its faculty members were members or sympathizers. The strikes in which CPLA was involved tend to be in industries from which its students came. In turn, some of the ablest students came out of these struggles and enriched the life of the school. Graduates in other industries were virtually all keenly aware of the low estate of unionism and regarded activity in CPLA as a natural result of Brookwood training. As the political developments created the vacuum which I have sketched a moment ago. And when the advent of the Roosevelt era opened up possibilities for activity in the field and what seemed a crying need for activity, some of the Brookwood staff, including myself, were drawn to devote more attention to these field activities under CPLA leadership. It was our inclination to think that Brookwood should emphasize its extension activities in order to link education directly with organizing and strike activity. 
we were prepared to consider selling the Brookwood property and using the money to establish the headquarters of the school in some industrial era uh, center. The fact that the school was experiencing financial difficulties, of course, introduced an element of tension into the controversy. A very important factor in the situation, I tend to think the basic one, as I look back, was a political one, which, as time went on, took some of us to the left, so to speak, to a deeply critical attitude toward the Roosevelt regime, to an attempt to form a non-communist left adapted to American conditions, and to refusal to support World War II, while others, by and large, <coughs> were drawn into the Roosevelt orbit, took posts in the CIO unions, and eventually supported the war. Trade union members of the board of directors had the majority vote in a corporation in which faculty members, graduates, and students also had votes. The trade union members, perhaps with some reluctance, voted against the policy which I was advocating, as did the majority of the faculty. The majority of students and graduates were on my side. I don't know what that means. But the result was that in the spring of 1933, I retired as Brookwood Educational Director. The break was a trying one for all who were caught in it, since in a real sense we had been a community and not an educational institution. The school had hard sledding following the break. I think it is ironical that this was in no small sense due to the fact that as the big organizing campaigns in automobiles, steel, aluminum, and so on, got underway, every worker who was worth his salt was needed in the struggle and could not be spared to go to a labor college for a year. At the same time, the new or nascent unions had to step up their educational programs on the spot. Now, I do not cite that development as conclusive evidence that our approach would have worked, since that would have depended on our relation to the leadership of the new unions and our attitude toward the trend which they subsequently followed. The result was that I now devoted full time to the CPLA and its successor organizations for several years. The first episode that should be noted here is an experience with the Communist Party in the trade union field. The CP had undertaken organizing independent unions in a number of industries when the New Deal legislation opened up the prospects for unionization. To the CP, trade union policy in previous years, which frequently was to organize unions as rivals to the AFL or independent unions, I had always been strongly opposed as divisive. I had also consistently opposed the policy of using unions as instruments to be manipulated for party purposes, any party. I had also, however, the early New Deal days seemed to present a new situation and consequent new possibilities. In important basic industries there were no unions, whatever. Many of us were convinced that the AFL hierarchy would make no effective or even serious effort to organize industrial unions in these key industries. The event witnessed the opposition the CIO organizing efforts encountered and its eventual though temporary separation from the AFL bore out our analysis in this respect. Under the circumstances, it appeared that a vacuum existed or was threatened, and there might be an opening for an effort to set up industrial unions independent of the old trade union structure and radically oriented. The CPLA people were also firmly convinced that to be successful, the new industrial unions had to be free from CP control and manipulation, or the control and manipulation of any 
political party group. Uh, the CP trade union specialists approached the CPLA people who had demonstrated their organizing ability <clears throat> and mass appeal in the unemployed leagues and in numerous strikes with the idea of combining forces and initiating a number of organizing campaigns in basic industries along CPLA lines. The CP already had small nuclei of what were called industrial unions in several industries the leaders of which were those who would naturally participate in a conference about joining forces with us. We laid down the condition, however, that in no case would any of these CPU, CP units be regarded as the nucleus of the new unions, which would have meant that our forces would simply be drawn into the CP organizing campaign. The new union was in each case to be built from the ground up and not to be under party control. The conference was held in Cleveland. After the usual preliminaries, the delegates were divided by industry, steel, glass, automobiles, and so on, and proceeded to discuss the procedure for their respective industries. These industry sessions had been underway for less than an hour before our people came out to report to me that the CP people were in each case standing firmly on the approach which we had rejected and arguing that the CP industrial unions be the nucleus for the organizing campaign and their trade union unity league the central body. I immediately informed the CP leaders that we refused to continue on this basis and that unless it was immediately changed, we would leave. No attempt to reply was made. But before I left the building, some of the CP trade union leaders took me aside and offered me the leadership of their trade union unity league. Why, I have no idea to this day. Again, I observe that it is ironical in view of such a development as this, that the CP gained its eventual very extensive influence in the unions by abandoning its essentially sectarian approach and sending its forces into the CIO organizing campaigns. In some cases, they were used by astute leaders like John L. Lewis and Philip Murray in the United Mine Workers who were basically anti-communist and always themselves in control. In other cases, communists did exercise control and probably on the whole did as good as average a job in strictly trade union matters as others, only to have their control challenged and in most cases broken in the post-war World War II McCarthyite era. The CPLA continued to play an active and to some extent leading role in the strikes which marked the beginning of the huge and eventually successful efforts to organize the basic industries and establish the CIO. Notable among them was the Toledo Autolite strike in 1963 to which the chairman referred. At a later date we were closely involved in the rubber strikes in Akron, Ohio where the sit-in tactic was first introduced into modern radical activity in this country. After the Autolite strike, I went to southern and central Illinois to report to our followers there on the Autolite experience. One morning with two young miners, I drove to a struck metal plant on the outskirts of Belleville, Illinois. The plant was closed and only two strikers were present as observers. The five of us sat down on the grass. A police car was parked uh, across the street. After a while, three policemen walked over, asked for identification, and looked at the red CPLA membership card, which the three of us carried. 
When at a preliminary hearing, one of the policemen was asked <coughs> by a Civil Liberties Union lawyer from St. Louis why he had arrested me, he answered, I thought that any preacher who was traveling like that so far from his home must be up to some mischief. And perhaps he had something there. <laughs> At any rate, I was indicted under the Illinois Treason Statute. It says statues here, <laughs> bad script. The Illinois Treason Statute, a relic of the A. Mitchell Palmer days after World War I, for conspiring to overthrow the state of Illinois by force and violence. <laughs> After some days in jail, friends from the Illinois miners succeeded in raising the $20,000 bail, which had been set. After about a year, the charge was dropped. It was pretty much inevitable that the CPLA activists and adherents, not finding the SP or the CP satisfactory, and profoundly skeptical as to where the New Deal was going, should in that period of ferment make the attempt to form their own political party. There were well-known intellectuals such as Sidney Hook, James Burnham, and Max Eastman who supported the idea and became either members or fellow travelers of the American Workers' Party. Accordingly, the CPLA, toward the end of 1953, uh, uh, 33, was transformed into the American Workers' Party intended to be, as someone quite correctly stated, a democratically organized revolutionary party seeking to build on the American revolutionary tradition and to function on an American and not Russian or other base. However, <clears throat> the AWP had hardly gotten underway when the Trotskyites, who had abandoned the idea of fighting their way back into the Communist Party and were functioning as the Communist League of America, approached us and proposed that merger be discussed. The AWP people who had started as labor activists and proved competent in that field had been politicalized in the course of their experience and were trying to build a political party home. The Trotskyites had, of course, come out of the CP, but had developed a strong desire to play a part in mass organization. Some of their leaders, especially in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, had brilliantly led, in the spring and summer, strikes of Teamsters there, which involved virtually all the unions in the city and seemed to have revolutionary possibilities. The merger seemed natural, or at least well worth trying, to the overwhelming majority of leaders and members in both groups, <clears throat> and it was consummated after prolonged discussions in 1935. The communists were disturbed and infuriated. <clears throat> the Daily Worker warned the Mustyites against, quote, the trap of counter-revolutionary Trotskyism end of quote, and warned the Trotskyists against, quote, unity with Musty, the champion of bourgeois nationalism, end of quote. <laughs> the new party was named Workers' Party USA, AWP, WP, USA. We were now members of the so-called Fourth International, which Trotsky had founded after being exiled from Russia, and in time, convinced that the third, then Stalinist international could not be redeemed. As I have been thinking back on those days, the chorus of a satiric song written some years later keeps running in my mind. It went like this. There's the first international, the second international, the third international, then louder, the fourth international, and then still louder, but we are the members of the last international and there won't be any more. End of the refrain. The authors may have magically defined the current Moscow-Peking split. 
The coll <coughs> collaboration <coughs> from which on both sides much had been expected soon became a troubled one. It revolved around a tactic devised by Trotsky and which was known in fourth international circles as the French turn. Trotsky had a strong following in France. The SP in that country, under the leadership of Leon Blum, was an impressive force. <clears throat> France was threatened also by fascist elements within, and the threat of an attack by Nazi Germany hung over it. The CP was seeking to build its own front against war and fascism. <clears throat> Under the circumstances, for reasons that are easily discernible, Trotsky decided that his followers should join the Socialist Party as a faction which would bore from within. He ordered them to do so. And I say ordered deliberately because I became convinced that though in many respects very different from Stalin, Trotsky was no less a dictator in his own party than Stalin in his. I did not have a clear judgment then as to whether under the conditions in France in the mid-30s, so few short years from the upheaval of 1939, French turn was morally justifiable and politically advisable. I do not have a clear judgment on that now, <clears throat> but I was quite clear that the application of the French turn in the United States, that is, entry into uh, of the newly formed Workers' Party into the then Norman Thomas Socialist Party, would not be morally justifiable or politically sound. We told the Communist League leaders that before the merger and were assured that there was no thought whatever of applying it here in the United States. Nevertheless, <clears throat> only a few months after the WP USA had been formed, one of the former communist leaders, communist league leaders, introduced at a meeting of our Politburo, we had now adopted this verbiage, introduced a resolution that the desirability of entering into the SP be explored. At the time, there were radical younger elements in the Socialist Party who regarded the party as reformist and wanted it to become revolutionary and who therefore also welcomed the idea of the merger. Discussions took place between them and the old-time Trotskyites in the WP, to which I was not invited. I and the Mustyites fought the proposal Apart from other considerations, I was convinced that entry into the SP would only weaken that organization and would divert the energies of the WP people from mass action and party building. The idea, of course, was to enter the SP in order to radicalize it, and this would be achieved by withdrawing the revolutionary elements in the SP out of it after a time and into the fourth international. Although nominally the WP USA went out of existence when all of us were accepted into membership in the SP, actually the Politburo of the Workers' Party met as usual the Monday after we had ceased to exist and function as a manipulative faction in the SP. My deductions were in this case correct. <clears throat> in less than two years, the Trotskyites were expelled from the SP for divisive activities. James Cannon, the leading American Trotskyist, told a reporter some years later that he remembers telling Trotsky about the weakened condition in which his forces had left the SP, and that, I quote, Comrade Trotsky said that alone would have justified our entry into the organization even if we hadn't gained a single member." End of quote. To me, this statement is one of the many proofs that in his later years, the brilliant Trotsky almost completely lost touch with reality, with political reality. 
In any case, the American Trotskyites did not grow either and soon were themselves involved in factional struggles. Now here I must turn back for a moment to bring into this survey of radical activities in the 30s a person with whom I was closely associated in those years and who must be included in any even sketchy account of the period. This is Louis F. Budens. I met him first in the early 20s. He had come to New York out of a circle of militant liberals in St. Louis, whence Roger Baldwin, principal founder and for many years the leader of the American Civil Liberties Union, had also come. Boudin's established and kept going for a number of years a monthly called Labor Age, which was to all intents and purposes, though not formally, an organ of the CPLA. Boudin's was a phenomenally effective organizer of strikes and demonstrations. Though one would not have guessed it from his appearance, he had no rival in those days as a speaker who could sway masses of workers and bring them out of the mill or mine and afterward on the picket line. From the beginning, he was a key figure in the CPLA and in the AWP when that came into being. When later I looked back on the discussions about merger with the Communist League, I realized clearly that I had all along, what I had all along suspected, that he lacked enthusiasm for that move. He did not, however, openly dissent from the step when it was finally taken, and he was enrolled in the Workers' Party of the U.S. His break with it <clears throat> was under circumstances about as dramatic as one can conceive. I have already spoken of my opposition to the proposal to infiltrate the SP. During the weeks when a hot internal discussion raged over that issue, Budenz was laid up with a painful siege of sinus trouble. I visited him from time to time. It was clear that he also opposed the French turn, but he gave me no hint whatever of the move he contemplated and which, no doubt, he had already secretly carried out. On the morning of the day when the crucial debate over the issue was to take place in the New York local of the WP, meeting which would be decisive since that local contained a very large percentage of the total national membership, the secret was revealed not having seen the papers on the way to the meeting, I was greeted on entering the hall with the news that Budenz, Arnold Johnson, and a few less important members of the WP had joined the Communist Party. The startling development naturally somewhat weakened my position in the debate which got underway an hour or so later. Some of the hardcore Trotskyists may even have suspected that most of the Mustyites, and even Musty himself, were already secret members of the CP. That was not, however, the case, and the suspicion, if it existed, was not brought out in the debate. There was another dramatic development that morning, however. There were a number of former members of the Communist League who had become members of the Musty Caucus since they opposed the application of the French term to the United States. That group received a cable from Trotsky himself, then in exile in Norway. It was a statement advising them to support entry into the SP, couched in such terms as to constitute an order, in my opinion. It certainly immensely strengthened the canon Schachtman caucus in the ensuing debate. The outcome of the debate was in favor of the SP entry, but not by a very large majority. As for Budenz, <clears throat> his entry into the CP at that juncture was understandable to me. He had always cherished an emotional attachment to the Soviet Union, perhaps one should say the Soviet people, 
though critical, of many aspects of Stalinism. He had become convinced that Trotskyist policy was bound to weaken the Soviet Union seriously in a period when the rise of Hitler in Germany threatened that country. The CP, under the leadership of Earl Browder, who is, I understand, another lecturer in this series, under the leadership of Earl Browder was entering on a period when its propaganda emphasized the American revolutionary tradition, as Budenz had always done, when it began to exercise formidable influence under the Roosevelt regime, such as Budenz had always sought, and when it turned to emphasis on union organizer, as Budenz had always done. The period of the U.S.-Soviet alliance in the war against Nazi Germany must have been one of profound satisfaction to Budenz as editor of the Daily Worker and a figure of some importance in the CP High Command. It is also understandable in my view that when the break between the United States and the Soviet Union developed after World War II, when Earl Browder was expelled from the CP, the party line hardened and its role in the unions was weakened, Budenz's enthusiasm for the CP should have cooled. That he should have returned to the Roman Catholic Church, into which he had been baptized at birth, <clears throat> is also understandable to me, and in a sense to be expected after the inner conflict he must have endured at times as a leader of the CP when the world communist movement was still under Stalinist domination. He had typically been under instruction of Fulton J. Sheen and a convert to Catholicism for some time before he publicly severed his connection with the CP and was publicly received back into the church. What is not understandable to me, except on grounds which subject his integrity to question, is that Budin should have become a crusader for anti-communism, a witness for the infamous House on american Activities Committee, and a factor of some importance in the McCarthyite scourge which afflicted the domestic life of the country as the Cold War policy came to dominate its foreign relations. Members of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the United States may have had a good deal to do with this turn on Budenz's part at that time. If so, they were out of accord with the spirit which largely animates the Roman Catholic Church today, as expressed in Pope John XXIII's historic encyclical and in the Vatican Council. When the news of Budenz's return to the Church broke, <clears throat> and it was hinted that he might become an anti-communist crusader. I wrote him a personal letter in the hope that it might lead to a renewal of friendship and a dialogue in which I might dissuade him from such a course. There was no reply from him, and we have never met since that time. Now, to draw to, toward a conclusion, I must speak of the turn in my own life and activity which followed the decision of the Workers' Party to enter the Socialist Party. At the outset, I submitted to the majority decision and nominally became an SP member. The controversy had been an exhausting one, and in the spring of 1936, friends of many different persuasions got together a purse to send my wife and me to Europe for a vacation. It was somewhat contradictory, but natural enough under the circumstances that our first stop should have been Norway for a week's conference with Leo Leon Trotsky, who was then an exile in that country, where a good many Labour Party members were sympathetic to the Fourth International, and the government was a civilized one. Trotsky and his wife were the guests in a small town near Oslo of a Labour Party editor 
who had spent some years in the United States with the IWW in the 20s and whom I had known in those days. During the week when I had numerous discussions with Trotsky <clears throat> and we ate our meals with him and his hosts, I was greatly impressed with him as a human being and with his intellectual versatility and brilliance. He tried very hard to persuade me to stay in the party. At the end of our talks, somewhat to my surprise, he said to me in effect that an American version of the French turn was not the right tactic, but it has been done and I should not let it drive me out of the party, to which I had too much to give. James P. Cannon, foremost leader of American Trotskyists, reported many years later that when I broke with them, Trotsky specifically cautioned me in a personal letter to keep the dispute within fraternal limits and to be careful not to say or do anything that would strike at Musty's prestige. So far as I know, the Trotskyists have adhered to that counsel. My next stop on that trip was at a secret meeting in Paris of the leaders of the Fourth International from many countries. A considerable number of them were as strongly opposed to the French turn in the application of the French turn in their respective countries as I had been. But as I have mentioned before, Trotsky dominated the party and the line was adhered to. Then the vacation began, which took us to Switzerland and later back again to Paris. And there I began the process of reflection, continued on the steamer back from New York, which led to my decision to break with the Trotskyist caucus in the Socialist Party and to let my pseudo-membership in that party lapse. I made my decision public in September 1936. I had come to reject the dogmatic Marxism-Leninism for which, as I came to see it, the Trotskyites stood. I was convinced that the concentration on political maneuvering, which was bound to follow the entry into the SP, would virtually eliminate our effectiveness in the mass struggles which were taking place in the basic industries. The way in which the entry into the SP was carried out and its underlying purpose were, in my mind, a violation of working class ethics which I could not stomach. To continue to operate in that atmosphere was impossible for me. <clears throat> 